another segment of uh, the newsroom, and we have uh, Pine Bluff and Jefferson County's power couple here with us today, <laughs> Gerald Robinson, our county judge, and Joni Alexander, a member of the city council. We're going to start with um, you, uh, Joni, first, um, and, and I'll, I don't mean to be facetious here, but what do we call you? Do we, do we, call you, do we still call you Alexander, or are you going to go with... Uh, Robinson after you leave office? You or? can call me either one and I proudly answer to okay. Robinson and Alexander <laughs> the same. So. Okay. Uh, back when you ran for office, you're in your, you're finishing up your first term. Yep. Um, you uh, weren't going to run for office, but then you changed your mind. What, what caused that? What, what caused you to run eventually? Well, you know, I worked for the previous administration under Hollinsworth, and I've always felt that it's better to be an asset to people and to help them. And when I tried to work with that city council at the time, it just became so personal. Politics came into play, and I guess it pissed me off just enough to think about running for office. And long story short, I did. I remember those days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very contentious. Yeah. Very. Um, childlike sometimes. Like it still is. Stuff. Yeah. Um, so you are, uh, even in that short answer, you know, you're, you're pretty outspoken <laughs> and uh, opinionated. Um, yeah. Maybe is a better description. <laughs> I'm guessing you could have run for mayor and, and um, perhaps be successful. I guess that would have been in two years. Uh, why, why throw in the towel now? Well, I'm... I have one term. I think we have term limits for a reason, just as much as the voters can come back and say if they want to keep a person. I think elected officials also have that option. And I'm finishing out my term strong. I'm going to continue to raise hell or be opinionated, <laughs> as you suggest. Um, but I feel like I'm not growing in that arena anymore. I don't have any mentors. I don't have anyone I look up to in that arena. And I feel like I'm constantly giving and I'm not being poured into. And I feel like um, I've done just enough that I could do other things and use what I've learned from this position to still help Pine Bluff. Okay. Yep. Uh, there's been a lot of debate uh, and the debate continues to follow the whole go forward Pine Bluff process. You have been a vocal supporter, um, but maybe you're not quite as vocal in your support these days. Um, if that's true, why have you pooled some on the, the initiative? So my support for Go Forward comes straight from I'm all for trying something new. I think people are so afraid of failure that we just tippy toe around things that we could be trying because even if Go Forward fails, there's still lessons in there that we can learn. At least we try to do something new. I'm not as vocal about it because it has become way too political. You know, I think both sides have kind of lost focus of the original goal. And so I know my platform, I have people that listen to me and respect what I say. And I don't want to use it to take advantage or stray their opinion of something. But I will say this, you know, the argument is always, well, this is what the people voted for. But as I always say, if your citizens are not uh, civic literate, then even if they built the plan, it doesn't mean it's the best plan, but still, who am I to think that my opinion trumps what was voted on at the ballot? And so that's where my support comes from with Go Forward. You know, without your presence on the council, Go Forward might be dismantled. Now, does that concern you? No. And the reason why is I think the council, if you look at the way we vote, 95% of the time, we really all vote the same way. The only time it comes up is when it comes to go forward, when we are split. And I will say, I think um, one side has got comfortable knowing that they have the votes. And me being a council member, even though I'm not very vocal on this, the communication is, there isn't any. You know, the communications or the representation from the city side is just strictly the mayor's office. Uh, the city council, we know nothing until there's a press release. And so maybe this will allow more communication 
more transparency and maybe people listening to those who do say that they have an issue with it. But I think if you get some progressive candidates, they'll still give it a chance. And most people running for my position are those types of candidates. But I do believe that there needs to be more transparency and more connection with the city council and executive office. Do you feel like some of, some of the council members have been shut out, actually all the council members? Yeah. Just so happens that half of them are inclined to vote against. That's ex forward. exactly how I feel because at the end of the day, I know people try to, they think that it's these four groups, but we actually all get along. We all talk behind the scenes and we're all being treated the same way. Some of us just don't retaliate in the same way or respond the same way because to me the bigger picture is the people and bringing something here and they did have a plan, but there does need to be more transparency, more communication as well. Broadly speaking, do you think Go Forward has been good for the city and would you support a re-up of the tax for another seven years or however they write another proposal? I would say it's been good for the city because I've never seen as many citizens vocal about anything concerning city government. If the tax was presented the, with that same plan that was initially given, I do not think I would be a supporter. I think it needs to be more things that focus on actual city government, uh, things, city operations, things that are long-term, that'll build a culture, enforcement codes, things that will last beyond tenure so that it doesn't matter who the mayor is or it doesn't matter who's on the council. We need to put fail-safes in mm -hmm. place. And I'm not saying they're not doing that, but I. I don't think the focus is just that. And I think if you're using tax dollars and it's coming from the city, we do need to focus more on city services and capital purchases. Okay. Uh, do you have a candidate that you're supporting uh, who's running for your seat? Yes, um, Letitia Brunson. And she lives in Broadmoor. That's who I have the most confidence in as far as the role of a city council member. You know, and I wanted to wait till I could go to as many debates and forums as I could. And a lot of people kind of glamorize uh, this office, you know, when it's really numbers with the budget, it's legislation and things of that nature. But a lot of people even run as if you're running for a nonprofit board or you're running to be a pastor or, you know, it, that has nothing to do with the city council. And I wish people really use their platform for what the job actually is. And that's the budget and legislation. What advice would you give your successor, whether it's Ms. Brunson or whoever? Um, I would say, in all you do, gain an understanding. Uh, get to know the people that you don't know, that you don't like. <laughs> There's a lesson even from our opponents or people that you disagree with. And there's no loyalty in business. Allow the budget to dictate your decision and do what's best, not for your friends or not for certain businesses. Do what's best for the city overall. Okay. Um, what are your plans post council? Uh, you, you, would you consider running for elected positions, other, other elected positions? Well, I can't say what I will not do because two years in the political arena is a really long time and a lot of things can change. And I am really good at politics, you know, who knew? So if someone would have told me two years prior to me running that I would be living in Pine Bluff and running for city council, I would have thought that they had lost their minds, but look at me now. And so through my journey so far, I can't tell you what that next move is going to be, but what it has taught me is things that I'm not going to um, any longer participate in. <laughs> and so who knows um, what I'll do next. But I, I know my focus is going to be on the citizens. Pine Bluff needs better citizens. And they also need a platform to be those better citizens from someone that's informed on city government and can actually hold their elected officials accountable in the right way. And I'll be able to pick and choose which constituents that I deal with. Because right now as a council member, all are created equal. But what I wanna focus on, the only requirement is that you have to be an active voter. Because I feel like being an active voter, you have taken the first step to really do your due diligence for your community. Okay, um, you, 
You spent a lot of time and energy on the racetrack committee yeah. putting that together. Mm -hmm. um, has that been a waste of time, or maybe a better way to put it, is there any possibility of that? There's happening? a lot of possibilities. So um, politics started to come into play. As I'm sure you know, behind the scenes is even hotter mess than uh, you know in front of the camera. And there's been some people trying to sabotage it. And so what I've done is I'm trying to do some work behind the scenes. And my goal is for it to make it to the ballot and allow the people to decide if they want a racetrack or not. What sort of sabotage? Um, different things. Um, people putting whispers out there about how some things won't work or how this won't do this, you know, without even seeking to gain an understanding. And to me, if you would do something like that negatively against this, that's your original intention. Yeah. Okay. Judge, you ready? Always. <laughs> uh, you and Sheriff Woods have been close and supportive of each other. Uh, you even endorsed him during his campaign. True. Uh, now it looks as though there's some animosity between the two of you. What's going on? Well, you know, I think that animosity only deals with, with on my behalf when it comes to budgeting uh, process. Because the county, uh, of course, you know, we, we, we deal with, uh, there's so many dynamics that goes on along with the budget. And uh, so when you start looking at revenues and different things like that, well, you know, we can only give you what the revenue that you bring in you know, it dictates, the money dictates what we give you. And so uh, in the public, it, it appears that Sheriff Woods and I have a problem. And I think that uh, in this process, uh, you know, the narrative have been, has been controlled by Sheriff Woods by stating that, you know, the judge doesn't like me, he, he has something against me, all those things, when that's, the farthest from the truth that, that uh, you know, that's the farthest from the truth. Uh, again, the fact is I did support him for um, his election. I did, uh, you know, we were friends. We, you know, all those things that go along with it. And I, and, uh, you know, I had confidence in him to be able to hold that office down. And so when, when we say or someone says, you know, it, it appears that you have a problem, I don't because I'm, I'm strictly business. I mean, I let the money dictate, you know, what we do. And so, uh, you know, again, that narrative has been controlled by one party because I'm not that type to go and say, uh, you know, to argue back and forth in the public or to bring up, you know, different things. I believe in getting the job done and, and keep it moving. So, so I've kind of let that, that narrative be controlled by one, by one party, and that's uh, Sheriff Woods. Um, can you talk about the lawsuit he filed against your office and the, and the form for it? Well, I can give you some parts of it. I, I can't get into the intricate details uh, as far as what the meat of his, uh, the lawsuit is about, but it is about the budget and, uh, you know, Sheriff Woods feeling like he hadn't received the adequate funding that uh, he uh, feels that he needs to uh, run his department. Uh, but what I can tell you is, is that budgets are proposed budgets. That means it's kind of like a wish list. It's, I mean, you know, you're asking for things that, that, that you need or want, but the revenue may not dictate everything that you get. And uh, so there's a, uh, you know, uh, a ditch to jump across there that, uh, you know, that Sheriff Woods uh, felt that myself and the quorum court did not adequately fund him when that's, that's the furthest from the truth. We gave him exactly what the revenue allowed us to give him. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the lawsuit, as you pointed out, is, is a money thing. Exactly. Um, but you have also uh, hit department heads with with requests or demands to, to cut. Um, and 
I looked up a quote that said, running this county is a business, we need 15 less employees, 15 employees less to be able to sustain the future. Um, when you brought that forth, that seemed to be quite a surprise to department heads. Could you do a better job of uh, communicating that to them um, so that it's not such a total slap in the face when they, when they hear that news? Well, um, and I really disagree with that uh, in, in respects that even before I became the, took office, uh, I had meetings with the elected officials. I had done research. Uh, I had researched other counties. I did the legwork and knew where we stood as a county because as, as the former sheriff, I came through the process where there were times we couldn't even make payroll or did not know how we would make payroll. And so in that process or researching and looking at other counties, you know, I found uh, several inadequacies that Jefferson County had. For instance, uh, having every elected official had a vehicle uh, and some assistant uh, department, I mean, or, or, or managers had vehicles. And so when you looked at, uh, you know, the number of vehicles that we had, uh, as opposed to a county who were thriving, and none of those elected officials had vehicles, well, then I knew that that was one of the one way that we could, uh, you know, cut uh, through some of the, the uh, expenses that we were having. And so I shared those things. If you uh, look at the history of the meetings that I had with them, it wasn't that it was something that uh, was just forced down their throat. These were ideas. These were uh, things that were brought to them. Uh, the research, uh, I told them about the research that was done, all those things. And so, you know, everybody knew that, we, excuse me, everybody knew that we had to do it, but no one wanted to be the one to do it. Mm -hmm. And so that was the issue. So as far as 15 fewer employees, how has that worked? Are you, are you there yet? It, yes. Uh, what uh, we had along with that was a hiring freeze. And so initially, uh, when I asked, to, for every department to relinquish one slot. Many of those slots were not even filled. And so it wasn't like some, they lost a, uh, lost a person, uh, maybe one or two departments. But uh, we immediately started seeing the, the uh, results of being able to eliminate those slots. I think we saved somewhere almost close to uh, $800,000 in that first you know, just along with the people, uh, not to mention $386,000 with the cars and the insurance and stuff like that. And if we had not done that, I could not foresee the future of a historic flood coming. But I always told the elected officials that short of a catastrophe, we're on the verge of bankruptcy. I didn't know it was coming, but if we had not done what we did, we would not have made it through that flood. We would have been bankrupt during the flood because it cost uh, major money to uh, take care of those, uh, especially with my road department budget. Um, the person handling the uh, technical end of this today, Lieutenant Coleman, recently broke a story about alleged use of excessive force in a county jail, the fact that Sheriff Woods had rehired a jail supervisor who was allegedly responsible. Clarify your stand on that episode. Uh, to me, that's very clear cut. Uh, I feel like the sheriff made a grave error in retaining that employee. Mm -hmm. I feel uh, as though that I'm disappointed, number one, because the sheriff was part of my staff. Uh, and when, you were. when I was sheriff, and I believe in fair, firm, and consistent. And I'd like to believe that in my administration, that's exactly what I was, fair, firm, and consistent. And so uh, also as sheriff, I developed the internal affairs department. And we did it for a reason so that we would have uh, a clear, concise 
mechanism in place that if an employee did something wrong, that uh, it was unbiased, but it strictly dealt with dealing with policy issues. And so uh, with this excessive force, this employee uh, was terminated uh, in 2014 under my administration, although he was brought back in my administration with the uh, uh, attorneys uh, saying that he would have to take an anger management class and all those things to come back, which at the time I still felt like it was a bad idea. But nevertheless, we, he was brought back. I was on my way out, as you well know, and I took office in 2019, so that was in 2018, I was on my way out. And so when this came about and this story broke, needless to say, I was very, very, um, I mean, it was, I was angered because I could not believe that the sheriff allowed this person to stay and I could not believe that this incident uh, went on. And, uh, and uh, you, it's, it's almost as if you rewarded the guy for beating somebody's butt in jail. You know, a slap on the hand and you bring him back. Now, the disappointment also came from the fact that we always, always followed the advice of our attorneys. They are the guru and they protect us from lawsuits and the, uh, you know, in the legal aspect. And you just don't go against, uh, you know, your attorneys. Number one, your IA investigators recommended termination. The chief deputy reviewed it, and he also recommended termination. He sends it to the attorneys. The attorneys look at the whole totality of the file, and they say, terminate. And then the sheriff comes back for some unknown reason and brings a person back. Very disappointing. So what that did for me, I mean, you just literally allowed us to be sued. And basically, uh, they can defend it, but the video don't lie, that doesn't lie. So it's going to cost us one way or the other. So that's why I'm disappointed. You have asked the prosecuting attorney to bring in the FBI to look into uh, operations of the jail, this, this case uh, specifically. Prosecuting attorney has been mom on the subject. Will you take further action on this topic? Yes, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm really kind of disappointed in our prosecuting attorney. Um, if you don't want to make a decision, good, bad, or ugly, give it to someone else. I mean, recuse yourself or, or bring in a special prosecutor, but at least let someone else look at it. And his, to me, in my opinion, his reluctance to even speak out about it or to even move on it uh, is very disappointing in my eyes, and I know that it's very disappointing in the public eyes because... Let's face it, a young man was beaten and received medical, I mean, had received injuries from this, and nothing has been done. And so, yes, I felt that as far as the county goes, me being the chief executive uh, officer in the county, uh, and 99% of the times when, a, uh, when you're sued, regardless whether it's another department or not, the executive is always named in the lawsuit. So I really felt like from the cry, from social media, from, you know, in the, excuse me again, uh, from the public that we really needed to uh, say, look, we're taking action. And so that's why I wrote the letter to uh, Kyle Hunter. And I still feel like that uh, if he does not move on it, that I will progress further, uh, either through the U.S. Attorney's Office or with the FBI myself. Has he not responded to your letter? To you? He he has responded, uh, but he he the response was, "I'll be getting with you later." Huh. And That's like three weeks ago, uh, if not longer. And so uh, you know, I just feel like this was something that needed to be moved on swiftly, and uh, and basically, let's just do our job. I mean, even if it's even if 
they don't find anything wrong. At least we have done what we're supposed to do. And I think that, uh, you know, as a prosecuting attorney, he should have been uh, quick to act and, and get this done. I recall that the, the man who was beaten, uh, he had a broken jaw. He lost a tooth. I think he had a broken did he have a broken nose? Fractured, fractured nose. Fractured nose? And, and an eye socket and that was. Eye socket. Yes. Um, and he, um, and, and I'm wondering, you know, we talked to his family, we talked to his, his mother and a couple sisters. Um, is, is, that what, is that what people can expect when they go into the county jail? <laughs> I would like to think not, but apparently uh, there's more that's going on that meets the eye. It, it certainly uh, should be something that's looked into. Uh, you know, just because we have individuals who, who allegedly commit a crime, you know, they have uh, rights upon incarceration. And when your loved ones or whoever they may be go into that environment, you expect them to still to remain uh, in a safe environment, to be treated fairly, to be treated uh, constitutionally right and uh, morally right. And when that doesn't happen, it calls a question upon uh, the person who heads that. And so I, I, I think we have a right to be, uh, to question the, the leadership when it comes to uh, uh, things of that nature continually to happen and the outcry that, that has been given. As you say, you know, he said, she said, uh, you can claim whatever suits you. Right. I suppose, but where, where's the but when it's documented, yes. When it's documented. Okay. It's, um, it's hard to argue with the video. Yes. As is the case in so many cases. In so many cases, that's right. Uh, can, you, can you explain the public-private partnership that helped you finance and get built the three public buildings here? Yes, yes. Uh, the way this, the way the three buildings uh, even got started, uh, I was meeting with uh, a group on an unrelated uh, project that had to do with uh, the city of Pine Bluff, and I was asked to be one of the panelists to decide, uh, you know, who would be a good fit for construction. Uh, and uh, sitting there listening to each of the individuals uh, go through, uh, I was really, really impressed with this P3 group. Uh, uh, the president, uh, CEO, D. Brown, I was very, very impressed with them. And I knew that uh, there were some things that the county needed, uh, the health department, because that was one of the things that I wanted to get done. Uh, and this was before I took office, didn't even know that the health department was a county building. That shows my ignorance. But uh, once I uh, went inside that building, I knew we had to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord knows, I already knew how bad the coroner's office, that, that building was falling in. I, man, I wouldn't, you know, I just wouldn't spend any time in there. And uh, then the VA office, the bathrooms didn't even work um, the majority of the time, nor the air, nor the internet, and it was just dilapidated. So. The public-private partnership upon meeting D. Brown, uh, he explained that the funds, uh, this, this is what really got me. The county didn't have to put up any money. We would basically uh, uh, get a uh, investor, such as a bank or whatever, to uh, supply the loan or whatever for the buildings to be built, and we would lease the building. And so that's what made it attractive because the county did not have any finances up front, especially to build those buildings in the conventional way, which had, you know, go through the, uh, uh, the bid processes and all those things. So uh, the public part of it is that they get public investors, such as a bank or whatever, to uh, supply the money, and then uh, it allowed the county to have some input in the construction, construction of the uh, uh, of the buildings and some say so how they wanted them to look and all those things, and uh, really it is it is I think 
it's the new wave of doing business because in many uh, uh, counties, municipalities, or, 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 or counties, or state, uh, do not have those funds readily available to put up front. And so it gives you an avenue to be able to construct those buildings without having to put money up front. And uh, so that's that's how it worked. And uh, so it, it worked out very well for the county. So the county doesn't own those buildings? We don't own them. Yes, they the lease the building. The, the, the building leases is for 30 years. But there's a clause that we put in that we can put up to a million dollars uh, toward uh, extra, other than the payment, toward the uh, uh, payoff, and you can actually pay the buildings off in 10 years, and that's what we... Uh, so they lease to own? Lease to own. Okay. After the 30-year period or after the buildings are paid off, you pay one penny, so, and okay. then the county and then the county owns all three buildings. So it's not just forever rent? Not just oh. forever rent, no. <laughs> Um, the county gets less than half of what the city gets in terms of tax dollars from Saracen Casino. Uh, should the county have tried to make a harder bargain for more tax dollars? Well, considering that the casino was on county land to start with. Well, I, <laughs> I kind of have uh, some uh, a bad taste in my mouth about that. Uh, in the original. Uh, negotiations, the county was to receive about 11% of the revenue, and the city, I think, was somewhere around 15%. Yeah. Now it's like 18 and 8. Now it's, yes, now it's like 18 and 8. And what happened, and I won't take away from what the city did, because actually it was a smooth move when the county was going through a little controversial uh, uh, time there between the judges, uh, between Hank Wilkins the, the fourth, and and the, by the time Booker Clemens, you know, took his place, um, somewhere in there the city went back to the table, and uh, drew out an additional three percent, which put them up to eighteen percent and dropped the county down to eight percent. Now, did I like that? No. I mean, I told them at the at the table once everything had been done. Uh, that if I was county judge at that time, that would have never happened. As a matter of fact, I would have clawed for, uh, for more, and we probably would have got a couple of percentage higher uh, than 11%. So, I mean, we were, <laughs> I, I would like to think that I would have negotiated for a higher amount. But, uh, you know, that happened. It was pretty smooth on the city's part, pretty slick. But uh, we, we come up on the short end of the stick on that. Um. You appointed, I believe I'm right here, you appointed Joni's mother to form court? No. The, the Democratic Central uh, Committee uh, placed her on the ballot. And so there was a selection process. She had to give a resume. She was interviewed by the Democratic Central Committee. And once they chose her, they put her on the ballot to be voted on which gave her, which, which uh, now makes her eligible to uh, run for re-election. But now if I had appointed her, she could only fill out that term of the uh, uh, person, uh, the remainder of the term. And, uh, but that's not uh, what she wanted. So she was put in contact with the Democratic Central Committee. Uh, interview process was done and she was uh, elected to, uh, or placed on the ballot. Um, is it ethical to have her on there and be married to her daughter? I think so. I mean, I feel like anyone who chooses to run, uh, let's say if, if, if my sister chose to run and, and she was elected, I mean, I don't think that that's unethical. unethical. Uh, and really, if you look throughout the, the courthouse, you have, <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, Mother, mother, uh, daughters. Uh, even though they may not be the elected official, but you know, supervisors in the office and and, and things of that nature. And uh, so I don't, I don't think that that's unethical, uh, uh, unless you are the elected official uh, supervising those. But as you know, uh, the quorum court uh, are elected officials, 
I'm not their bosses, and, and uh, they are the legislative body. And so uh, I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, uh, she's one of 13 votes. And no one else applied yes. to be put on the ballot. You know, she's the only yeah. one. So. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Yes. It's not true. <laughs> yeah. it sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. So what, you're running for re-election. Yes. Uh, what are you, your plans? So you would, uh, these are four-year terms. Exactly. Um, you have moved up from sheriff to county judge. Do you have higher political aspirations? No, not right now. I, I mean, I think after this, I, I am done. Uh, you know, I am, uh, you, you know, uh, and, I, and I tell you, uh, like you that, <laughs> that this has become one of the nastiest political seasons that I have ever been involved. Uh, in and God forbid if it was a state wide race that I was uh, in I mean you know you listen to the ads and all those things you know you, you I'm a type of person that I'm gonna say what's on my mind I couldn't be the governor of the state because if I tell you to go to you I, could. I, I mean, Trump yeah, won. Yeah, you know, yeah, so but uh, I don't like think that. it. I don't think it'll be perceived uh, the same. The same. Why not? Uh, I just feel like <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like it wouldn't be perceived the right way. Hey, yeah, look, as as I'm talking straightforward now, you see what it does to the people around me, you know. But uh, uh, again, but no, I, I don't have any any admirations to go any higher. But uh, but at the same time, Byron, I really like doing what I'm doing. It gives me a greater sense of uh, accomplishment because I'm involved with so much, uh, you know, instrumental in helping bring car tie here, instrumental in bringing Good Day Farms here, instrumental in getting uh, three buildings uh, uh, built, a casino. Uh, a casino, you know, jobs, economic growth. New equipment uh, for the yeah, road department. Yeah, road department. Mm -hmm. Capital improvement, over $650 million. That I've been involved in. County reserve. Yeah, in a, in a county reserve that has grown from thirty thousand dollars to to over four million dollars, and and my goal was to to have five million dollars in my first term. Looks like we're going to surpass that five million in reserves. In reserves, yes. Well, you mentioned the casino again. You know, Polk County I I still haven't got it done. Still not making a dime. Not making a dime. Although. And I took a lot of heat. I took a lot of heat. I had to curse me a few people out. <laughs> Excuse me. I had to curse a few people out because, you know, and I know I recognize we live in the Bible Belt and all those things, but all these Bible Belt people, uh, preachers along with teachers and everybody else, was going down to Tunica, going to Mississippi, and you'd go down there and you'd see them down there. But, oh, woe is me for having a casino in Pine Bluff, Jefferson County. I didn't want to hear that crap. You know, I thought about the, the, the economics of it, mm -hmm. the, the jobs, uh, uh, help Pine Bluff rebound. And, uh, and let's face it, man, you go in, I mean, you think you're in, in, a, in another state when, you, when you're in that casino. So, uh, you know, when you, when you look at all those things, we, did, we made the right decision. You did. The casino saved Pine Bluff. It did. Because we haven't cut anything. That helped us to balance our budget and also <laughs> give raises, which I hate that all of that is dependent upon that revenue. I don't think that's the right way to go yeah. about it, but it did. We were going down a very bad hill. I've had people <laughs> to even say, man, we need you to run the, the, the county and the city. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to tell you, I don't have a problem making tough decisions. I always, you know, because the numbers dictate what you do. Yeah. And if you look at, and you have to go and compare yourself to other people who are doing well, you know, uh, the Craighead counties, the Saline counties, the, they have more people but less employees and thriving. And listen, listen. It's not that they don't have crime or those same things that's going on as they are in Pine Bluff. Isn't they? they might not be published as much as Pine Bluff, but they're having the same issues, I promise you. But they don't promote that. They promote their cities in a positive 
manner. And their reserves, if you look at their financials of, of how they're doing things, they are, uh, you know, they cut the waste, they have less employees, they're more automated. So, and if you go in their offices, and I've talked, I've gone in their offices, Judge Airy there in, in, in Saline County, and uh, uh, Marvin Day up in Craighead County, gone in the offices, and each one of those offices that I went into, whether it be a county clerk's office or whether it was a circuit clerk, every one of the employees knew how to do the other's job. Not so here. Not so here. As a matter of fact, uh, here, I guess it may have been uh, maybe a couple of two or three weeks ago, uh, a person went in a particular office, and I won't call the office out, but went in a particular office and they were told, well, you have to wait to so-and-so come back before we can do that. Come on, they, they're, they're in your office. You ought to be able to serve the public. I don't care what it is. You ought to know those particular jobs. So, and, and uh, you know, here in Jefferson County, I think we use our automation funds for uh, uh, <laughs> a stash, you know, uh, and, and not use it for what they're meant to be used for, and you just want to see it grow and grow and grow and grow. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe that uh, we should use those monies for what they need to be used for. So uh, even down to, to my department, uh, I mean, you know, we use automation for our, our, our uh, uh, trucks, our, you know, work to be done. It, it gives you the amount of hours that you should spend on particular jobs, all those things. So we, we've done a lot. Even with our sanitation, it's going, going automation and stuff now where you can pay your sanitation by a push of a button. So we have to move forward. We cannot keep that cliche of that's the way we've always done it. Nothing pisses me off more to hear something like that. That's the way we've always done it. Mm. That doesn't make it the uh, right thing, and it doesn't mean that we're moving forward. What's been your most challenging hurdle as county judge? Dealing with childish, grown people. You, you think that uh, when you have individuals in these offices uh, that you have a consummate of professionals, but sometimes you forget that they have emotions just like everybody else. And what I mean by that is, is that my dad used to always tell me what's in a person going to always come out. We got some childish people. We got some people that, uh, you know, as long as you're doing for them, they're okay. But as soon as you make a decision that against the grain, they're, they're mad from that point on, you could do a thousand things for them. And the one time you don't do what they ask you to do or want you to do, they're mad for life. And uh, so that's been one of the, the biggest thing for me. And, uh, and I'll tell you, with my 34 years, almost 35 years of being uh, in politics and working for government, uh, I think that a lot of times that because they've had that relationship with me, whether I was sheriff or whatever, uh, that they feel as though they can come to me and say certain things to me that I know that under previous administration, they wouldn't have dared open their mouth. Mm -hmm. I've seen them sit in meetings and was quiet as a church mouth. I've seen in, in my tenure now that people, individuals, elected officials, that wouldn't dare open their mouth to say anything to help me when I was losing the biggest part of my budget or my budget being cut, wouldn't say a word but because they built these allegiances and because I'm making these tough decisions that, uh, you know, they speaking up for each other and all that kind of stuff. And so it's been very disappointing. So that's prob probably been uh, the biggest disappointment for me. But uh, I let disappointment make me tougher, grow, uh, you know, navigate me to what I need to do. And, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with that. As long as I'm fair, firm, and consistent.
Council member, what about you? What's been your biggest challenge? Um, people not understanding city government. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all read the comments under some post and the things that people want us to do. It's like that's not our job. And the ignorance, I feel like in 2022, is almost a choice. You have so much access to things now. Um, people always say that we need to get out there, we need to inform the citizens, but all of our meetings are public. You know, everything is recorded. You can mm -hmm. always go and get information. We're open, but it's one of us. And we have so many constituents. Um, I was sitting here thinking in my three and a half years as an older person, only one person has come to me and said, what do you need? What do you want me to do? One. Only one mm -hmm. yeah. has come to me mm -hmm. and asked that. I mean, and, and said that to me. And so I think that that speaks volumes. And not only are people ignorant to city government, they're boldly ignorant. You know, and, and, yes. and it's no type of platform or arena to correct them. And a lot of our elected officials use that against people. They play off that they play ignorance. They play off yeah. the ignorance of, the, of people to... To, uh, to win. Yes. As soon as you get elected, you're running for re-election. Um, you have people that'll say... I'm going to fix the flood and, you know, I'm going to get these kids out the street. I'm going after crime and haven't looked at any data. Yes. You know, it's just, so, and I, I hate that because being ignorant does make you weak. And it's people playing off of that, um, appealing to your emotions, you know, as we call them demigods. And it's going on and until the people realize that, that's the issue with Pine Bluff. 